Welcome everyone to The Great Sources, Season 2, Episode 25. Today's year is called, What Makes Eretz Yisrael Special? Part 4, How to Make Heaven on Earth. And of course, what I would like to teach you today is what does it mean to make heaven on earth and how should we do so? Okay, so at the end of last year, I told you about the connection between Lech Lecha, that was at Davram, the connection between that and the Akedo story, which begins with also with a Lech Lecha, which I'm telling Avram, Lech Lecha El Eretz HaMaria. And it's very obvious that these things are connected because these are essentially two travels or two alias in Kedusha. First, Avram is told to go to Eretz Yisrael, which is one level of Kedusha. But within Eretz Yisrael, there's a further level of Kedusha, which is the Beis HaMikdash. And this is the natural continuation of Avram's career, his Lech Lecha career. The natural continuation is to continue in his travels. First to the Eretz HaKodesh and then to the Har HaKodesh. By the way, that's reflected, of course, in the Mishnah in the end of Ksubis, which is where the Gemara talks about Eretz Yisrael, the whole series of Eretz Yisrael, at the end of Ksubis, the Mishnah it says, HaKol Malim Eretz Yisrael. And HaKol Malim Yushalayim. Anyone could force his spouse to move to Eretz Yisrael, anyone could force his spouse to move even within Eretz Yisrael to Yushalayim. So there are two levels of trips, two levels of travels that a person could undertake, like Avram Avinu, first through Eretz Yisrael and then further to the Mokim HaMikdash. So that tells us then that if we want to think about what Lech Lecha is about, what Eretz Yisrael is all about, the Akedah story should have something to teach us about that. Right? Because if the Akedah is a continuation of Lech Lecha, and it's a continuation of what Eretz Yisrael is all about, because the Mokom HaMikdash within Eretz Yisrael is the holiest part of Eretz Yisrael. So it's a continuation of this traveling to a holy land, is to, con is to travel to the holiest part of the holy land. So that would suggest that the Akeda story has what to teach us about Eretz Yisrael, about what Eretz Yisrael is all about, how to access it, and um, what we need to do to get the Kedush of Eretz Yisrael. And indeed that's the case, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So, the first Lech Lecha, of course, as we've been discussing, is all about Arecha. It's all about Avram learning to see things like Hashem does. Lech Lecha, it's Arecha, means I'm going to make you see in the same way that I do. Man can come to learn to see things as Hashem does. That's the first Lech Lecha. Okay. Um, Hashem sees the world and he sees the Toiv Be'enov. He sees the world as being good because of what he wants from the world. And man can, in fact, learn how to see the world with Hashem's perspective. That's what Lech Allah Echo is all about. Now, let's see what the Akedah tells us about Eretz Yisrael. So I want to start with exploring the Akedah story on its own terms. Well, I want to analyze it in a certain way and look at it from a certain perspective. And then we'll take it back and we'll see what that has to teach us about Eretz Yisrael. So the Akeda story, okay, Avram Avinu is told, of course, to be Mala Yitzchak as an Ayla, and he passes the test with flying colors, he's willing to do it, and he only stops when the Malach Menashe tells him not to do it, but of course Avram Avinu demonstrated his willingness to sacrifice even his son to Hashem. Okay, so if you read the end of Ayer, if you read the Akeda story, it seems like the Akeda was a unqualified, smashing success, everything happened exactly as it should have, Avram Avinu demonstrated his willingness to be Mark of his son. But, actually that's incorrect. Actually, the Akeda narrative ends in a certain failure. Something about it went wrong. And I'll explain exactly, well, I'll explain what that's about. First, let me show you where we see that. We see that because 
As we know famously, Chazal connect the death of Sarah to the Akeda. And there's this Medrash, if you're looking at the source sheets, this is up to number three. The Medrash, of course, says that the Satan got very upset after the Akeda, and he wanted to get something. So he went to Sarah and he told her, you know that Avram was about to Shech Yitzchak, and okay, very dramatic, and Sarah dies, because it. So what they're doing is they're connecting the death of Sarah with the Akedah. Now, it's very important to understand that the fact that Sarah died due to the Satan, or the way Chazal put it, due to the Satan's disappointment with the way the Akedah worked out. Um, what they're doing is essentially they're saying that that the Akedah story wasn't a complete success. And that's because as we know, the Satan was very involved in the Akedah story. Remember, the Satan is the Malach HaMavis. The Gemara Babash says, who's Satan, who Yetzar, who Malach HaMavis? Those are all one and the same thing. How those are all one and the same thing, we're not going to go into now. Satan, Yetzar, Malach HaMavis, all one and the same thing. So if we say that, oh, look, someone died after the Akedah story, right? That's what happened. What happened was that someone died. So the Satan achieved something. He achieved death, which is one of his big things, one of his big jobs, is to kill people. Okay. The Satan, as we know, was very involved in the Akeda. In fact, the whole Akeda, the Satan says, you know, we have to have a test. The Satan requires a test, requires tests in general. The Satan is one who demands tests. And of course, you have all the Midrashim about the Satan's involvement during the Akedah, trying to stop Avram and so on and so forth. The story of the Akedah, Chazal are teaching us, Chazal teaches in general, the Kam of Kam Midrash, and the story of the Akedah revolves around the Satan, which means a way, a, 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 a certain way, a method to frame the Akedah story and to understand what it's really about is to talk about it in terms of the Satan. The Satan who A, demanded a test from Avram, B, is um, the Eid Sahara, who tries to get him not to do God's will and sees the Malach HaMavis who ends up killing Sarah. Okay. So, fine. Now we have a, an approach how to look at the Akedah story. The Akedah story is a story about vanquishing the Satan or doing battle with the Satan. And of course, Avram Avinu did what he was supposed to and yet the Satan snatches some victory and he kills Sarah. He gets Sarah to die. So he did something, right? The Satan is not completely gone. The Malach is still, still in our midst, um, despite the fact that Avram Avinu battled the Satan and passed his test. Yet, despite that, the Satan is still there and it succeeds in causing Sarah's death. Okay, that's I'm just framing it how Chazal wants to look at it. Now, think about that a little further. Um, very significant. Sarah dies, and of course, we have the beginning of Chayes Sarah. A whole a whole negotiation with none other than Ephraim. Ephraim, of course, says Afar in his name because uh, this is a very significant parsha because he's the one who's selling Afar. He's the one who's selling a burial plot to Avram Avinu. And as we've been mentioned just now, the fact that the Satan succeeded in killing Sarah means there's still death. There's a focus on death here. Death is very important because the Satan kills. In other words, the Akedah story is the struggle with Satan. But look, there's still death, right? It's a way to look at it. That he beat the Satan, as it were. Avram Avinu was victorious over the Satan and he passed the test. And the Satan didn't succeed. But no, no, no. The Satan still does succeed in some, in some way. And he causes Sarah to die. Okay, so the Satan, who Malach HaMavis, is still very, very active. And therefore, it's very appropriate that there's this whole debate about land represented by Ephraim, who has offer in his name, because this is about, conceptually, this parish is about whether death has a hold on us, has a hold over humans, which is obviously represented by Afar, ki Afar Atav al Afar Toshav. Now, let me explain a little bit, a little bit more what's, um, what's going on. Um, Avram Avinu, as we started, was commanded to make two journeys. 
Journey number one is to Eretz Yisrael, Lech Lecha, and that's a Sher Eker. Journey number two, the final journey, the, 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 the last thing in Avram's career, is to go to Eretz Amiria, to Achad Aharim. Okay, so as we said, it's all about Lech Lecha, it's all about going somewhere. Now, when he finally gets there, when did Avram Avinu finally get there? When did he finally arrive? Not after the first Lech Lecha, there's another Lech Lecha, right? You have to go to Eretz Yisrael, and then after you go to Eretz you have to go to Makam Mikdash. Parenthetically, have to see this expansion. Kisavai, the beginning of Kisavai is, is, is doing that same idea. It's when you come to the Aretz, when you come to the Aretz, there's another Bia, there's another coming. Don't just stop at the Aretz. Make sure you bring your fruits of the Aretz and go to the Mikdash. So there's always a, a, a next level of traveling, a next level of Kedusha that you have to aspire to. Okay, so Avram Avinu finally did his Lech Lechos, right? He went to the Aretz Shar Echo and he went to Aretz Maria and he did there on the Aretz Maria exactly what he was commanded to do. So now what you would expect was, what you would expect is that Avram Avinu should actually get, should actually acquire, should actually take control, or ownership and control of, of the Aretz. Because he made it, he got to where he's supposed to go. And, and there is a story of Avram Avinu purchasing and acquiring a, a piece of the land. That's the whole beginning of Chayesar and the whole negotiation of buying the Masamach Pelon. But, but, in fact, in fact, what should have happened, what I mean to say is, if the Akedah would have succeeded completely, Another. Let me, let me just bear with me over here. The fact that the Satan caused Sarah to die means that the concept of the Akedah, the battle with the Satan is not over. Okay? The battle with the Satan is not over. I'm calling that the, the Akedah didn't succeed completely. Because if, in as much as what the Akedah is about is the struggle with the Satan, and in as much as the Satan still has something to do post Akedah, which is kill Sarah, to that extent I say that the Akedah wasn't an unqualified success. And then... The Akedah, which is about, okay, you went to Eretz Yisrael, now go to the next place, go to the center of Eretz Yisrael, go to the nucleus of Eretz Yisrael. Of course, should be followed by an acquisition of Eretz Yisrael. Right? That's the most natural thing. Avram Avinu was lech lecha, lech lecha, twice, he got there, he got there, he made it. Okay, now take the Machman Mikdash. Oh, take the Machman Mikdash, right? Exactly. What would you expect that Avram Avinu should get? What should he acquire when he made it to the nucleus of Eretz Yisrael? He should acquire the nucleus of Eretz Yisrael. He should be able to get the Machman Mikdash. Make it his, purchase it, and um, purchase it for him and for Bnei Yisrael forever. That's exactly what you would expect. Instead, he buys um, Chevron. Chevron. It's very important. He buys Chevron, which is a burial plot, not even necessarily the greatest piece of land. In fact, the Gemara says in Ksubis that, um, and we're jumping around a little bit in the, in the source sheet here, but the Gemara says in is number nine that Hebron is the most rocky place in Eretz Yisrael. It's 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 the worst, least fertile land because that's what they that's what they bury people because it's rocky and it's not not the most the best land for um, for agriculture for farming. So while you would expect that the the second Lech Lecha, which takes Avram to the heart of Eretz Yisrael, you would expect that it should climax in the acquisition of Eretz Yisrael, or at least the nucleus of Eretz Yisrael, the, the, perhaps the Mokma Mikdash. Instead, what happens is Avram Avinu purchases the Psylas of Eretz Yisrael, and not just the Psylas of Eretz Yisrael, but burial. And it's very important because the fact that it's burial, because the fact that he's buying a burial plot actually is the is the polar opposite of the Makam Mikdash. Because the Makam Mikdash, as indicated by the Akedah, is the Makam where you bring a carbon, as Avram Avinu did, an Ayel Tachas Benoi. You kill the animal, and the human lives. So the Mikdash is the place of human life. It's the place where we sacrifice animals and thereby secure human life. What that's about, how that works, obviously, this is not the forum for that. But that's the climax of the Akedah is okay, there's an Ayel Tachas Benoi. And that becomes the base Hamikdash, right? Which is where we always bring Kabbanis instead of humans, essentially. Instead of our own lives. And that's how we preserve our lives, with the Kaifer Nefesh. With the Kaifer. That's represented by the animal. So, <clears throat> the fact that Avraham Avinu did not purchase Hamaria, the place of life, and instead purchased Chavon, is very significant because he bought the place of death, or the place for dead people, 
instead of getting the Makom is just a place for live people. And the proof, the proof that, the proof that was in fact supposed to happen, again, I don't like saying that in fact supposed to happen. Everything happened was it was supposed to happen. What I mean to say is the, the fact that the ideal, the ideal occurrence, let's call it, would have been for Avram Avinu to um, purchase Hamaria after that Keda is evidenced by the following. There is a parallel story to the Akeda and to the purchase of the Marsa Machpela. There's a parallel story in Tanakh. In other words, there's a story in Tanakh that clearly matches and rhymes with the story and even continu- continues, in fact, continues the Akeda story. And that story is by David HaMelech. David HaMelech, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the Rashi Prakam about it. David HaMelech, this is the end of uh, Shmuel Bey's last parak in Shmuel and his parak of Aleph and Tevei Yomim. And the story goes, David HaMelech counted B'nai Yisrael, and as the Pesach says in Tevei Yomim, the Satan got him to count B'nai Yisrael. We all know how much the Satan has to do with counting. Machzah Shekel has to protect us from the Satan. The Kaifer Nefesh, okay? We're going to talk about that a little more about because another time. But the Satan got David to count B'nai Yisrael. And David counts them, and of course, there's a Magaifa. Well, it, there's a Magaifa, okay? There ends up being a Magaifa. And David Amalek says the following Pasuk, and this is in Shmuel Bays. David Amalek says, I'm the one who sinned. Anoichi chotasi, anoichi hevesi, ve'ele hatsoin me'asu. Tehina yod chabi of base avi. I'm the one who sinned. What has the sheep done? This is because there was a Malach and there was a Magaifa, and David Amalek saw people dying, and he said, What have the sheep done? I'm, what have the sheep done? Meaning the people, the innocent people. I'm the one who sinned. Take me. So David Amalek is sacrificing himself instead of the sheep, offering himself instead of the sheep. And when Hashem sees this, Hashem tells the Malach, Okay, stop. My gave is over. Stop killing the people. God comes to David and tells him to um, set up a Mizbeach in the Goyrin of Aravna the Yavusi. And David Amalek goes to Aravna, and there's a whole negotiation about purchasing the Goyrin. A whole negotiation, Ein Sham. Aravna offers it to him for free, and David says, no, 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 I'm not going to take it for free. And if this reminds you of something, it's, it should. It reminds you of the purchase of the Marsa Machpela, because there, David HaMelech is purchasing the Makam Mikdash. So what happens is like this. The Akedah ends with a blessing. The Akedah is all about the Satan, and it ends with a blessing that B'nai Yisrael will be like stars. David HaMelech counts them. Uh-oh, stars are not supposed to be counted. That necessitates another Akedah. Okay, what this all means, I think we're going to get to this in a further share. But the fact is, David HaMelech there does another Akedah. Why? Because he sacrifices himself instead of the quote-unquote sheep. When he's willing to sacrifice himself, that's when Hashem tells the Malach, who's standing between heaven and earth with his sword outstretched, tells him, stop. Remember, that's like the Malach calling to Avram, who has his sword, his knife on Yitzhak's neck, and tells him, stop. And the other Hashem tells the Malach, Rav, stop, hold your hand, stay your hand. And then David HaMelech, um, like Avram Avinu, who dedicated the Mokam HaMikdash, that's when David HaMelech goes and purchases the Mokam HaMikdash. And what that tells me, that confirms that the natural conclusion of the Akedah story is not for Avram Avinu to walk away from Hara Maria, for us never to hear of it again for a thousand years. Okay, not a thousand years, whatever the number is. Um, from Avram Avinu to David. Right? The, it doesn't make sense that after the Akeda story, okay, we don't hear another word about Hamer. We have Ramid who walks away from this holiest place that he declared is going to be the mountain of Hashem, Mahar Hashem Yirah, and instead of purchasing it and actually making it into a Makam Mikdash, she just says, okay, one day in the distant future, no one ever knows about it, no one ever hears about it, it's the Makam Hashiv Hashem. We only find out about it when Davan HaMalach has to go buy it from this fellow, Aravna, the Yavusi. And listen to this. The pick of the Blazer says, that this is number um, eight in the source sheet that the Bnei Ches who sold Avram Avinu the Marsa Machpela they're the ones who moved to Yerushalayim which is then called used to be called Yavos and they made a deal with Avram Avinu that we'll sell you the Marsa Machpela but when your descendants come and take out the soil they have to leave us Yavos Yerushalayim and that's why says the Medrash David had to purchase Hamaria from Aravna, the Yibusi. And what the Medrash is doing, it's basically saying this whole point. It's saying that the purchase of the Marsa Machpelah 
instead of Hare Maria, which is the most natural, natural thing that Avram Avinu should get after the Akedah should require is the, is the Hare Maria. And the purchase of the Chevron, of course, Machpelah, instead of in lieu of Hare Maria, indicates that maybe we don't have Hare Maria. Maybe we can't get Hare Maria. And Dovod HaMelech had to do the Akedah again. Something had to happen again. Something wasn't fully completed until there was a, an Akedah redox. And, oh, okay, only then is there the purchase of Hare Maria. Now, um, like I said, we're going to talk about this a little more another time. Those who are interested, this is, of course, very important, very interesting. And the more you understand about this, the better you are, of course, the better you'll, you'll understand about it. So, so I reference you to take a look at my Sefer, Eris Yaakov, Drush, Avraham, Vidovid, Chilik, Aleph, and Bez. Um, I go through this. Of course, Chilik Gimel continues that, but this is but what I've discussed for today's discussion. You can look at Aleph and Bez. That's on page 110, Kuf Yud and on. Okay, so the Makkah Mikdash is the place of life where you replace the human life with the animal life, sacrifice, and of course, Hevron is a place of death. And the place, as we said, of Afar, which is why there's no better name for the um, seller of Hevron, Marsan Chpela, than Ephraim. Okay, now. Here we get to the Parsha of Miraglam. Now we arrive at this question of the Parsha of Miraglam. Okay, because I, I want to show you how. Simply in Cheshbin. The question of Lech Lecha, Lech Lecha Laratzashar Eka, and then there's another Lech Lecha. Um, to the Aretz Maria. The Miraglim, it's, as I'm soon going to show you, what the Miraglim do is they pick up, as it were, where Avram Avinu left off. Because Avram Avinu's Lech Lechaz, his, his taking over the Aretz, was incomplete. Because in as much as the second Lech Lechaz, there's a lot of Chesh in here, and soon I'll explain to you what it all means. But I just want, I want, it's important for me that you understand, see the Chesh, in other words, see where this comes out of the Pesukim. Since Avram Avinu had to do two Lech Lechaz, that means his first Lech Lechaz, Sharek, is not complete until he does the second Lech Lechaz. And the Akedah. Now the Miraglim, as I'm soon going to show you, are seeking to pick up where Avram Avinu left off, right? Because where we come to Eretz Yisrael from? Nechatei we should come to Eretz Yisrael. What type of business is this? Shlach lecha andash v'esu yasetz kanan. Why? Oh, because uh, you're actually descendants of Avram Avinu. Remember lecha lecha etz shareka. Okay. And you guys can do, you're able to do what Avram Avinu did. Or are you? As we shall soon see, that's what the Miraglim are out to determine. Because here's one Remez, here's the major Remez, but it, it, this also I reference you to, to the Sefer of Yaakov. Ephraim, Mr. Offer, said to Avram Avinu, Eretz Abra Me'eshev Kesef, Ben Yehu Ben Mahi. Mahi. And that message, that Mahi, coming from Ephraim, is a very important statement, because what he's saying is, the deeper meaning is, Ephraim is about Offer, right? Avram Avinu, L'chaira, stands for this idea that there can be a holy land, that Afar can be holy, that we could redeem, as this is what we're going to discuss, that we could redeem the land from the Satan, that we can escape death, we can do an Ayel Tachas Benoi, we can make a holy land with a holy temple in its center. Ephraim says to Avram Avinu, welcome, I knew you would come. Meaning, what happened ultimately? It didn't work. See, we all die. See, you can't cheat death, you can't cheat the Satan. Eret ben yu ben chamahi. I'm offer. Ephron is offer. Offer. Nothing. Just physical, plain, material earth. Not holy. And Ephron says to Avram, we're all the same. There's no difference between me and you. The aretz between me is mahi. The aretz, there's no difference between my aretz, which is just offer, just dirt, and your aretz, supposedly, which is about to be this holy, supposed to be this holy thing. No. There's no such thing, says Ephron. It's all offer. Hakal hayom and offer. Hakal shavel offer. That's it. That's what life is all about. That's what the aretz is all about. And the Miraglim were told, Mahi, and that's picking up Ephraim's Mahi, which means they are on a miss mission to determine who's right. Is Ephraim right? Is it impossible to redeem the Aretz from the Satan? Is it impossible to make a holy land, as Ephraim argued? 
And the stories of Avram, in fact, do suggest that. Don't underestimate this. The stories of Avram do suggest that this project of Avram, of Lech Lecha, Lech Shara Eka, and then the Lech Lecha, Lech Samaria, maybe is just a chaloimis. Maybe it's just dreams that actually cannot be implemented. Because look what happened. It didn't work. It didn't work. The Satan won. Avram Avinu did not achieve what, what he is supposed to achieve. So that suggests that Ephron is right. Ephron who said, Mahi, what's the difference to me and you, Avram? We're all the same. See, you're bowing down to me. You're, you're lying yourself on the earth. You're lying yourself to the dirt. You're putting yourself down on the dirt. Um, we're all the same. Aretz is just a place of Ahafar. The Miraglim are told, we said, Masat's Mahi, go see who's right. Meaning, can we continue the spiritual destiny of Avram Avinu or not? Maybe we can't. And that's why the, the Hebron is so important in the story of the Miraglim, right? Um, because, yes, with Pasuk says, they went up to Hebron, and of course, Kalev went to the Mekta, to the Mars Machpelo, to Davin. Which means, again, I'm a little bit out of order here. That's number 16 and number 17. The Moran Saita says that Kalev was Pirjat's Raglam went to the Mars Machpelah because the whole question of the Miraglim is how to understand the next chapter in the story of Avram and his descendants. And again, I'm going to explain to you exactly what this means. Um, how exactly we see this from the Pasuk and Mother Morazim, again, I reference you to, I, I refer you to uh, the Aris Yaakov. For now, what we need to discuss today for these Shurim is what, what this all means and what the Lamais is. Because if we want to be Mechapar on the Chet Miraglim, which is, of course, a very laudable goal, we have to understand what the Chet is, right? And what I'm going to tell you now, I'm going to explain to you what this whole thing is all about, what does it mean to redeem a land from a Satan, and therefore to understand what exactly the Miraglim's hate was and I say exactly and I mean exactly because I'm going to tell you something which is what the Miraglim is all about and of course what I'm telling you is not something that every single Sefer that talks about the Miraglim explains because the way the Torah is written Torah writes things so that you can understand things in a surface way in a surface level and you can say shut them and questions and answers all on a surface level but what I'm telling you today, I'm telling you the premise, I'm telling you the inner meaning of what happened with the Chet Maraglim. Because if we want to undo the essence of the Maraglim, we have to know what the essence is. It's not sufficient to learn the, the Pirish Pashot or the Pirish Chitzaini of the Parsha and to talk about the various of Farshim say this and the various of Farshim say that, who are dealing with the Pshat, dealing with the the outer level that the Torah writes, because that's how the Torah always writes things. The Torah always writes deep, very deep, pneumistic things and dresses it up in a chitonistic level, which you could, chitonistic layer, which you can analyze and derive very important things from on a pshat level. What I want to tell you now is the inner meaning of the Chetim Raglam, because if we want to, like I said, if we want to undo the Chetim Raglam, we have to know what was it in its essence. So, I'm going to explain to you soon what this, what this is all about, the whole question of the Satan and the Aretz, but I want to just tell you exactly what I mean in terms of what the Miraglim's mission, mission was. We have this destiny, we have this goal, this dream that begins with Avram Avinu, which is Lech Lech Olad Sharek. And as we've been discussing, this is not about real estate, it's not about getting a certain land, it's about establishing a land where there's a people First starting with a person, Avram Avinu, and then a whole nation of people who can see things, who will see things as Hashem sees them. Right? That's what it's about. And that's an amazing thing and that everything depends on that. And if you can see things from Hashem's perspective, if you can really practice and learn how to see things from Hashem's perspective, you are going to never sin. Not only are you never going to sin, but if you can do this as a society, you'll have a society that never sins. You'll have a society where everyone is seeing what Hashem wants them to see and how Hashem wants them to see it and they're understanding the world from Hashem's eyes and then of course they're doing exactly what Hashem would do and as we talked about they know Hashem and they implement Hashem's midas of Chesem Mishmet stuck on earth and it's just amazing that's what it's all about that's what we care about not only is that what we care about that's all we care about the Miraglim 
had a very, very specific mission, okay? Try to forget the parak, try to forget the psukim for a minute because this is so different than the chitonius and the pshat that sometimes it's hard to process it. The miracle had a very, certain, a very specific mission, okay? Here we have this, this idea, this, this tremendous idea, this dream, this vision that Avram Avinu had, that it's possible to see a land like Hashem does. And it's possible for me to see that like, land like Hashem does. And it's possible for me to teach that to my descendants and to create a society of people that sees the land, that sees the world from Hashem's perspective. This is Avram Avinu's mission. Come B'nai Yisrael, and they're at the edge of Eretz Yisrael, and the question is, can we do this? Can we do this? Very good question. It's a very important question. Are the people, the B'nai Yisrael, where they're at today, are they holding by this Madrega? That's, that's what the Miraculous Mission was all about. The trip to Eretz Yisrael is like a, a pilot, let's call it, like a pilot trip, to see whether the they, the Miraglim themselves, and therefore the people who they lead, are, are would be able to live up to this kind of vision, this kind of idea and ideal. Would they be able to continue what Avram Avinu was doing? And therefore will the people be able to do it too? The mission of the Miraglim is not a mission of, oh, hey, we have to conquer land, let's go spy. No, 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 that's not what it's about. It's Mamsh, not what it's about. What it's about is to see whether the people are spiritually on the level that they can continue Avram Avinu's mission. Okay, so we'll get back to that soon, a little bit more, um, what that means for us. But now I want to talk to you about, okay, so what does this all mean, this whole business of, there's this battle with the Satan, who's the Malach Moves, which was not completely victorious for Avram Avinu's side and therefore he killed Sarah so that means it's still Satan and the earth is still basic forest instead of being a holy land and therefore there's a question of whether we can continue that continue Avram Avinu's mission I want to explain to you exactly what this all means okay Satan has to do with earth the earth that's a positive says in Eve that the Satan floats around in the earth. And the Ramah makes this point in the Mar Nevuchim that the Satan has no shaykhs to the Meroimim, to heavens. The Satan is only in the Aretz, as the Pasuk says in Eov, Mishut Ba'aretz, Umehis Halech Ba. The Satan told Hashem, where were you? Hashem asked him, I was floating around the earth. That's what the Satan does. So the Satan is this earthy being, okay? Now, um, in the Akeda story, when Avram Avinu does what he was supposed to do and, and demonstrates that he's willing to sacrifice Yitzchak, there's a major stress on the Shemayim. The Pasuk says that the Malach called from Shemayim and it called him a second time in HaShemayim and he told him that I will bless your children to be like the stars of the Shemayim. Chazal say, that Avram Avinu, after the Akedah, said to Hashem, why are you testing me? You could read my mind. Remember the whole Akedah, the whole test has to do with the Satan. The Satan demands a test. But Hashem doesn't need tests. Hashem knows what a person's thinking. Miyad says the Medrash, heavens opened up. The heavens opened up. And, and Hashem said to Avram Binishpati. So what I'm showing you for the Medrash is that there's an idea. And from the Pesukim that say that the mouth calls from the heavens. There's an idea that while the Akedah, and the need to do anything for the Satan is based on the fact that there's some earthy being called Satan. We can, in fact, transcend this earthy being, Satan, and become heavenly. Become heavenly. The Malach will call from heaven. Our descendants will be like the stars of the heaven. And the heavens will open up and there will be no barriers between us and heaven. Okay, so now we have an idea, a let's call it a conceptual uh, poles, way to frame the, 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 the narrative here. It's about heaven and earth. There's earth and there's heaven. The earth is a Satan's domain. Satan ro roams around the earth and reports back to God. And in fact, not only reports back to him, but he, he makes things happen on earth because he says, well, there has to be tests. I need people to suffer. That's the story of Eve. He floats around the earth and he sees Eve and he says, I need him to be tested. I need everyone Movino to be tested. So the Satan is an earth creature and then there's also heaven heaven 
The Satan, as the Ramam says, the Satan has no place in heaven. So I want to explain to you exactly what that means. Heaven, or Shemaya means the place of Hashem. When we say the place of Hashem, we mean to say the place where everything that happens, happens by Hashem. Humans don't have any effect on Shemayim. Shemayim, Shemayim, Hashem. We are the sound of Ne'odam. So the Shemayim, as being the place of Hashem's action, it's the place where everything happens in unity. Meaning, everything that happens is an absolute reflection, or a manifestation, better, better word, of Hashem's Midas, of Chesed, Mishwad, and Staka. So everything that happens in the heavens, where humans have no maga, humans have no um, power over affecting the heavens, everything that happens in the Shemayim is godly. Godly. Then there's another realm. That other realm is called the earth. Now in the earth, as we know, also sound of the Adam. So in the earth, well, people might do an accurate reflection of heaven. They might actually do exactly what God does in the heavens, but they might not. They might not. If we emulate the heavens, that means if we do in earth something which accurately um, captures the Midas of Hashem and His actions in the heavens, if we do that, then what we're doing is we're bringing heaven down to earth. We're replicating heaven on earth. If we don't, in other words, to the extent that we don't fully understand what heaven's about, what Hashem's actions are about, and we do something else, we create a different model of reality. So that introduces disunity. Instead of everything being unified, instead of everything being part of one unified planet, everything working together, every person introduces his own unique selfish perspective, which is not the same as the actions of Hashem in heaven, which are chesem mishpudetztaka, and that's how we get to Piru. That's how we get to disunity. Okay. That's the idea of Satan. The idea of Satan is, there's like, a, there's like, important word, keyword. Kaviachal, there's like another source, another force than God. Why? Because Shemayim is Lashem. Aretz, ah, the Satan's in the arts, which means that corresponds to the fact that Aretz is not something they are. The Satan is in our hearts. The Satan is in our hearts. The Satan means we sometimes don't completely and accurately emulate the godly midas that are manifest in Hashem's actions in the heavens. And then we introduce some other force, some other way of thinking other than Hashem's actions. Let's talk about why the Satan is the Malach HaMavis. What's death? Death is when an individual person comes to an end. Okay? If we would emulate God's actions and reproduce God's actions in heaven in the heavens on earth, there will be no death. What that means is, that means is, God's actions are eternal. If we would see the world the same way God does, in terms of his eternal midas of chesed mishburut staka, then the individuals who come and go would be irrelevant. That's not the truest reality, would be the eternal midas of chesed mishburut staka. It's the fact that we look at the world and we see pratim, we see details, we see individual people. So then when a person dies, that's death, that's an end, that's a problem. Okay? We're going to talk about that from a little bit of a different angle next time. I want to explain to you, I want to just get this key point across. Satan means heaven is not replicated on earth. The Satan, you think of the Satan, right? And you think about it like, oh, there's this other force besides Vashem, this angel who has some power on earth. And it's true. It's true in the sense that it means... That God in heaven, again, meaning Hashem does everything that he wants to do in the Shemayim because man can't corrupt that, man can't get involved. But Hashem is not necessarily present on earth because on earth, man has a choice. Either we can see the earth like Hashem does, understand what's toy ve'ene Hashem. If we do that, then what we're going to do is accurately, completely emulate, mimic the actions of Hashem in Shemayim, the Chesed Mishmud Staka, which is all of creation, all of the universe, and we're going to replicate that on earth. If we replicate that on earth, there's no Satan. There's heaven on earth. There's holiness on earth. But if we're not able to replicate that, then we're giving room for the Satan. So, that's why the Lech Lecha, Allah's Shara continues with this next Lech Lecha, which is about doing battle with the Satan. Now, 
what why do you have to do an akeda and what exactly happened that the akeda didn't work and why specifically in the death of sar these are tremendous sides tremendous secrets which are not for this forum this is of course the most important question this is what we should always be talking about but i have to pick what's the most relevant to this discussion what's relevant to this discussion is this point the climax of the climax of seeing the world like Hashem does is the complete banishment of the Satan because it's making heaven on earth not taking the earth and saying okay God does what he wants he created the world but now we can create the earth in our own image that's disconnecting the earth from heaven that's making the earth the place of Satan or we can say no 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 let's look to the heavens Let's look to how Hashem creates His world. And let's be active on earth in the model, in the same way that Hashem is active in the heavens. That's the our echo, that's the proper our echo, seeing the earth as Hashem does. And the accomplishment of that is that we would banish the Satan and make the earth heavenly. And what does that, what does that bring to? That brings obviously to Hashem Because we make it that, we make it that the earth is a comfortable place for Hashem. Right? You make it like, oh, what would it take for God to be comfortable on earth? I, I know exactly what it would be comfortable. Give him what he's used to. Well, what's he used to? Well, let's see. What does he do? What does he like? What's toy ben? It's as simple as that. If you look at what's toy ben Hashem, which is represented in the Shemayim, the place that's uncorrupted by humans, and instead of saying the Oretz is whatever humans make it to be, we say, no, no, no. We want to make an Oretz in the image of Shemayim. So what we're doing is that would, by doing that, we invite Hashem to dwell in the Oretz. We say the Oretz is as heavenly or as holy as the heaven is. So that's sanctifying the Aretz, is um, taking it out of the domain of the Satan. Not to see, not to see, meaning not to perceive things as being details, like, okay, there's me and there's you and there's all the, the Pratim. No, to understand that everything is part of eternal rules of God, that of God's action, to see things in that way, and then to act in that way too. Okay, so of course it all depends on Re'iyah. And this is exactly what the Meraglim had to determine. Is the nation of Israel, are they able to do this? Or maybe, look, the fact is that Avram Avinu's case, as great as Avram Avinu was, it couldn't, it couldn't be completed. It wasn't done. It wasn't absolutely achieved. The death of Sarah. Death of Sarah means, represents, maybe, we cannot sanctify the Aretz. So they had to go to heaven, and they had to go to Syria. So it's Mahi, who is right? Is Avram Avinu right, or is Ephraim right? Is the Aretz just a place of offer, a place of death, a place of Satan, or can the Aretz be made heavenly? And that's why, as we mentioned earlier, Kalev goes to heaven and he, because he recognizes what the Maratz Machpelah is all about. So, <clears throat> in the arcade, I mean, sorry, in the Meraglim story, we have, of course, the ten Meraglim, the ten bad guys, and, and Yeshua and Kalev. And what, the, what, the, what I'm explaining to you today is that the Miraglim had a mission to determine the level of Bnei Yisrael, whether they're holding by continuing the Abrahamic uh, agenda, ideal of, of trying to sanctify the earth, of trying to bring heaven down to earth, and, or bring earth up to heaven, I would like to say it. And so the ten of them determined that they're not. Now, why are we blaming the ten? Of them? Why are they bad guys? Because they're the leaders. And they're not just determining whether the people are up to it or not, but meaning they're not just on a fact-finding mission, but whether if they think that it can be done, then they can make it happen. Because they're the leaders. The people follow the leaders. Um, Yeshuv and Kalev are the ones who say, Oloi nale, and they say, no, it can't be done. And by again, by insisting it can be done, they want to make it happen. So, you know, what we're doing in this in this series of Shurim is trying to understand the Chet Amaraglim and trying to then be Mechaper for it. Now, if we understand it very well, which I hope we hope we're getting to understand it better and better as we go through these conversations, if you understand what it's about, like, okay, can we approach the earth instead of saying, okay, there's me and all I want is a nice house and I want to live and I just want, I'm selfish. Can I look at the world through Hashem's eyes and say, look, I know what Hashem's doing in the Shemayim. Let's replicate Shemayim Ale Arts. Let's make the earth in the model, in, in the image of heaven. Let's think about the eternal actions that God does in heaven. And let's try to make those have a place on earth too and forget about all the silly stuff that we think about because we look at the earth from our own perspective. That's it in a nutshell, right? 
And can we all do that as a community, as a nation? That's the question. If we all firstly understand that and then we say, actually, I think we're not able to do that. So you know what we're doing? We're literally doing what the 10 Meraglim did. Shuv and Kalev are the ones who said, no, we can do it. And I think, I think our obligation is to believe that it can be done. And if we believe it can be done, to have the amuna that it could be done, the commitment and the faith that it could be done, that will make it be able to happen. If we would be like Yeshua and Kali, who said, no, we can do it. If we all say we can do it, then we can do it. But if we all don't have the amuna say, I don't know, maybe we can't do it. Well, that's how it won't be able to be doable. So again, what I'm telling you is the premius, is the inner meaning of the ragam. Of course, there's a lot of things in the Chitanias in the surface level which, as we said, the Torah is written in a way that the surface level also has Pshatim, and there's a lot to learn from that also, but if we want to um, <clears throat> really get to what the Torah cares about and what, what are therefore obligations, we have to get to the secret meaning of the Meraglim, we have to uncover it, and that's what we did. So, so that's what it means to be a holy land. Now, now I think when we talk about a holy land, we can at least know what it means. A holy land means a place that has like a heavenly economy. What does a heavenly economy mean? Instead of basing the economy on, let's say, selfishness, we'll base on an economy on understanding the, the heavenly laws, how God interacts with his world. And we'll use that as a means of motivating our own action. And everything will be heavenly. Everything in that earth, everything in that society is heavenly because if the motivating, if what motivates humans' action is their perceptions of God's action and perception of what God believes in and what he believes in, funny word, what he likes, what's toy bein of, that's when you have a heavenly society. Okay, that is the, that is the dream that starts and continues with the Akeda and continues with failure in the Miraglim and that's what we have to try to um, fix today. So, <laughs> to make the earth into a place where Hashem, for Hashem, where He's comfortable, so to speak. And for this, you need, of course, we need people to understand this and we need people to sign on to this and be part of this agenda. This is our greatest duty, in my opinion, and back, getting back to why Eretz Yisrael as a specific land is so important, because you need a critical mass of people who care about religion, who care about this. You need them to live together, and together are talking to each other back, hey, what's Taibe Hashem? Tell me what's Taibe Hashem, and let's do it. I want to understand heaven, and I want to replicate the, the heaven on the Oretz. If we'd see things from Hashem's perspective, so then we'll know that there's just Taib. There won't be any Ra, there'll be unity instead of Pirud, there'll be life instead of death, and earth will become heavenly, eternal, and, and good forever. And that, getting back to what we started with, that's why in, in, the, in the last few shurim I've been saying, the Gemara says, you live in that soil, you're oven. Okay, that's what we're trying to get at. That's what I want to get. I want to get at Shabbat oven. I don't want to settle for less. Yeah, because the idea is, remember, the Satan is the Yetzirah Hara, and he's the Malach HaMavis. So, the ultimate getting the Oretz is to vanquish the Satan. Vanquish the Satan is to vanquish the Yetzirah Hara. And that's how you get to being Shabbat oven.